वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु we are studying the second chapter we are almost at the end and uh, we missed a couple of classes we had two wonderful guest lecturers coming in on the last two weeks so if you remember in the second chapter there are these three great themes one is the teaching about the atman what am i who am i or what am i why is that important because you know in vedanta the core idea is if we know reality as it is all our problems will be solved solved in a spiritual sense and what is that reality reality is supposed to be brahman existence consciousness bliss outside inside but you'll have to re- uh, realize that as i am that so the search for this reality is not really outside but inside what am i so the teaching about the atman atman here means the self teaching about the atman was the first great theme of this chapter and that's really central that is the central teaching of vedanta who am i or what am i and then there was this subject of karma yoga so all this teaching is wonderful but how does it relate to my work a day life my daily life and then finally the third great theme which is the characteristics of the enlightened person when one becomes enlightened what is it like and that's what's going on now we are almost at the end i think we'll we'll complete the second chapter chapter today the last three verses if you remember the last class last time we talked about this there was a very interesting verse that what is day to the enlightened it's as bright and as clear as day to the enlightened is like night to the unenlightened and what is day to the unenlightened is like night to the enlightened so a paradoxical verse what is day is night to them and what is night to them is day to the rest of us it's like that so sometimes in the bhagavad gita sometimes in advaita vedanta the language of paradox is used because the ultimate reality is beyond the grasp of language one of the strategies adopted in vedanta to express the ultimate reality see the problem for the scriptures is what they are trying to talk about is beyond language but the texts are language so you have to express you have to say what cannot be said and they have ways of getting around this problem what are the ways you know them one is if i cannot say what 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 is to be said i can at least say what it is not not this not this the neti neti another is by implication um, you you set up a certain thing and you point towards the ultimate truth another way is they're using the language of of paradox if you can get the paradox you get what is being talked about that that cannot be directly expressed and sometimes krishna uses this so for example here he says night and day he uses the paradoxical language i think in the fourth chapter he will say what is action um the one who sees action in inaction and in action in action that one truly sees and that one is the doer of all action that sounds very cool but what does it really mean <laughs> so paradoxical one more verse much further ahead i think in the ninth chapter is see all beings are in me the entire universe is in me the lord says in one verse and the next verse he says but then the universe is not in me look at the power of maya the magic of maya can anybody raise a, can you raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you there's one here right right yeah there's a cute little story about about these verses difficult verses um you know the story how the gita and the mahabharata the gita is only a small part of the greatest epic ever written greatest literally because it's more than 100000 verses the story is that the sage vyasa composed the mahabharata and he had a uh, had a stenographer he, he dictated it 
you know the story every every indian child knows the story ganesha is the person who took down the uh, dictation now the problem was ganesha is very fast so ganesha set a condition to the sage he said that i'm going to write but you cannot stop dictating and that's a big thing 100000 verses you cannot stop if, if there's any break in your dictation then i'll stop and i won't write so you have to keep up with me imagine composing verses in sanskrit uh, to keep up with with ganesha but vyasa is no less he said all right i'll do that but i have a condition too you must understand what you write so i'll dictate and you write as fast as you can but you must you must understand don't write without understanding so ganesha said done and they started and very soon the old sage vyasa began to get breathless because <laughs> Ganesh is going so fast so on purpose he would compose these difficult verses which Ganesh would go hmm what does it mean <laughs> and you can imagine the old bearded sage going who <laughs> <laughs> and then quickly composing a few more in the time Ganesh says get it i i got it and then vyasa goes on so this is how it went i maybe these verses are those verses difficult verses in that verse which we did enlightenment is compared to day advaita the non dual reality that is compared to day and the world of ignorance which we inhabit darkness is compared to night so the day of the enlightened is is like night to the rest of us and the opposite too what is like day to us this world is like night to the enlightened night to the enlightened means it's of no consequence they see it but they see it as an appearance they see the reality underneath they see that it is brahman alone appearing as this universe this universe does not have a separate independent reality apart from the absolute so this is day is compared to enlightenment or advaita let me say it outright night is compared to dvaita dual <laughs> duality and another example that the sanskrit commentators use is a man and an owl and an owl i don't know if i mentioned this last time man and an owl that keeps coming up in the in the commentaries on the gita just as we can see in daytime but that which is night is difficult is obscure for us but the owl sees what is in in, in darkness sees it very clearly you can see a little mouse scurrying around and can swoop and catch the poor little mouse but in the daytime it is befuddled it's confused uh, and they say that divandha blind in the day blind means practically blind of course it's not blind but it's too bright for the owl i don't know if you have you seen an owl in daytime they get very confused and helpless so the enlightened person is compared to a human being who sees the reality as clear as day and our samsara is like night to that person and the unenlightened person most of us except a lucky few maybe the unenlightened person is compared to an owl who is perfectly at ease in the night of samsara but what is daytime to the enlightened person the brahman blazing forth all the time that is darkness to the unenlightened to the owl all right now we'll go ahead verse number verse number 69 70 we have done 69 right we done 69 we'll do 70 70 71 and 72 are the last three verses of this chapter and they're really grand very beautiful verses 70 here the the meter changes please chant after me आपूर्यमाण अचल प्रतिष्ठ आपूर्यमाण अचल प्रतिष्ठ समुद्रमाप प्रवशति यद्रमाप प्रवशति यद्वत्मा प्रवशति सर्वे तद्वत्मा प्रवशति सर्वे स शातिमाति न काम कामी न शातिमाति न काम कामी एन एग्जाम्पल इज गिवन अबाउट होम अबाउट द एनलाइटन पर्सन 
what is the enlightened person like when that person is in the world like us? Immersed in samadhi, immersed in trance, in meditation, that's different. But just like us, when that person is walking and talking and interacting with others, how is that person different from the rest of us? So very beautiful example. Example of the ocean. Apuryamanam machalam pratishtam. Samudra. Samudra means the ocean. As the rivers of the different, um, uh, uh, as water from different rivers pour into the ocean and it is undisturbed, it absorbs it all. As the water of rain pours into the ocean, the ocean is undisturbed. It neither increases nor decreases. Undisturbed. Whereas rivers are always in themselves. They are always subject to over flooding, drying up, more water, less water. The reason being the rivers and lakes and ponds, they do not have an independent source of water. They ultimately depend on the ocean for water. One can quibble, but don't. It's an example. It's a beautiful example. So imagine the vast ocean, uh, undisturbed. Even when there is a huge storm, like a tsunami or a cyclone. You know, recently there was a very powerful cyclone. If you follow, if you're one of those people following up on weather, <laughs> uh, there's a very powerful cyclone in India. Phony. Uh, it's most people pronounce it funny, but it's supposed to be pronounced phony. There's nothing phony about it. <laughs> it was like one of the most powerful cyclones that ever hit uh, India. And uh, I was following it last night when it crossed the coast of Puri. And it was, it's interesting for me, funny for me, <laughs> because uh, that's the place I spent my childhood. Um, so for the first time hearing those names on CNN and CBS, the, the Weather Channel, they're talking that, of course, mangling the names, but uh, but they're talking about Bhuvaneshwar and, and Puri. Um, you, you can imagine gale force winds, 155 miles per hour, 185 miles per hour, more than 205 kilometers per hour, slamming into the, um, the coastline. Tremendous. Um, and yet the sea today, in the morning I looked it up again, calm. It's gone. The sea is calm. People are not. <laughs> when you're hit by that. So, the, the sea, after all of the tumult, it is still the vast surging sea, neither more nor less. Samudram apa pravishanti yadvat. So, this is an example. Just as all these waters run into the sea, into the ocean, and the ocean is undisturbed, it's still the same ocean. It absorbs it all. In the same way, all the sensations, all the desirable, karma literally means that which is desired. Um, the commentators say that which is desired by people of the world, by the unenlightened. All those things pour into the enlightened person's mind. How? Through the five rivers. What are the five rivers? Eyes and ears and nose and skin and sp the five senses. Uh, tongue. So the five senses, what we see and hear and smell and taste and touch. And among all of these things, there are things which we like. To see and hear and smell and taste and touch. So these desirable sensations are pouring into the mind. And yet the mind of this enlightened person is like the vast ocean. Serene, undisturbed. Does not care at all. Makes no, dis makes no difference to this person. So here is the difference. The enlightened person is compared to the ocean. And by implication, the unenlightened person is compared to a river or a pond or a lake. The river depends on other sources of water. Otherwise, it dries up. In the same way, people in the world, people who are unenlightened, in the world is not quite correct, who are unenlightened, when we do not know the reality within us, we depend on the world for satisfaction. Nice food, nice place to stay, and... Um, um, nice career to look forward to, uh, a few words of praise and a little bit of popularity. So this is where I'm invested in. I, I, if it, it would be very nice, you know, if it happens. And the opposite is also immediately true. If it does not happen, what if? You know, we have two things. If only, if only X, Y, Z. And what if, oh my God, what if this happens, <laughs> uh, some other things. So this is how most people lead, uh, live, their, uh, live their lives. 
tempted or terrified. Fear or fascination. And the enlightened person is none of this. Because inside the, uh, the enlightened person finds in his own real nature as Brahman, complete satisfaction. There is nothing more to be desired beyond that. Totally and completely at peace. So when the rivers of the senses flow into that person's awareness, sights, sounds, tastes and all of that, it makes no difference. It is as undisturbed as the ocean. Notice that here this person is fully engaged with the world. It's not that the senses are shut as in meditation. Oh, I won't see. I won't hear. I won't, I'm deeply in meditation, not aware of the external world. He's not speaking about an enlightened person like that. He's speaking about an enlightened person in the world, uh, working, talking, mixing with people, teaching maybe. So this person is active. Uh, there's a difference. Do you see the difference between it? Does it make sense? Uh, one depends on the world for fulfillment. The one has absolute, other one has no dependence on the world for fulfillment. Not depending on the world for fulfillment, not chasing the world for happiness, not going around with a begging bowl for a little bit of happiness from the world. Now this enlightened person calmly and serenely can do what has to be done. The rest of us, we are driven. We are driven by, by fear and temptation and anxiety. This person has no anxiety. He knows he cannot die. The body will die. Nothing to him. However, one thing, the commentators, they make it clear that this person, whatever the minimum requirements of the body, food and shelter, that person may use. But even there, there is no attachment. The literal term used by Madhusudan Saraswati, one of the commentators from 600 years ago, Kopina chadana matrena, even for um, the loincloth which a wandering monk wears, even for that also there is no attachment. So, that kind of uh, non-attachment. However, one point I want to make here is, there are many stories in the Indian myths which show, in the Indian stories about uh, uh, mythology, which show attachment and non-attachment does not really depend on how much one has or how little one has. So, the great story, story about um, the emperor Janaka and the uh, Paramaham, so the wandering monk, uh, the, the great teacher, um, Shukadeva, I think. So, now don't take them literally. If, if you say, hey, this is a story which is not very kind to the sage Shukadeva, so don't say later on that, oh, so Shukadeva was like that. No, he was not. These stories are meant to prove a point, that's all. They're not meant to be taken historically. So the story goes, the great non-dualist teacher Shukadeva comes to the emperor Janaka, emperor of Mithila. Um, so, he comes and teaches philosophy. While they were talking, a messenger runs in and says, Emperor, Emperor, the city is on fire. And the emperor says, um, all right, I'll deal with this. And he suddenly sees the sage jump up and rush off like an arrow, like a shot he's off. After some time, the sage comes running back, Shukadeva comes running back. And uh, the emperor asks him, where did you go to in such a, te a tearing hurry? He said, oh, I have only, see, he has nothing in the world. He has only one change of his uh, loincloth, which I had washed in the river and hung on the tree to dry. And I thought, if it's on fire, maybe it'll get burnt up. Let me go and, and make sure. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's, not, it's not getting burnt, so it's, it's fine. And Janaka smiled. He said, oh, sage, one loincloth. And here is the entire capital city of the empire, which... Remember, he's not like Nero fiddling while, the, while Rome burns. He's doing what has to be done. But he is not in ang anxiety or terror. The entire capital city, his city, he says, Mithilayam pradigdhayam name dahati kinchana. If the entire city of Mithila were to be burned to ashes, not a single, not, nothing of, of what is truly me would be touched. He does, he's not being ruthless there, that, that the city be burned, not at all, just the opposite. He's taking care of it, and yet you see the complete detachment. So it's not that to be detached, to 
sort of float above the world, in the world, and yet not of, uh, not of it, you have to be a wandering monk like that. Not necessarily. The point of the story is, you can have all that is in the, in the world, an emperor, an absolute monarch, all that is in the world, and yet be completely detached from it. Remember, Krishna, who is teaching, and Arjuna, who is receiving this, the teachings, both are, are they monks? Are they monks? They are householders. Both of them are warriors and householders. They are married, they have children, they have um, empires to run, and so on. So, they are not monks. And he is giving this teaching to Arjuna. Uh, to be practiced in life, not in a, in a mountain cave. So, this is, this is the beauty of the teaching. In the midst of life, in the midst of the hurly and burly of life, Eternal calmness. Swami Vivekananda said, the ideal of Karma Yoga, the ideal of, of Vedanta is, in the midst of the most intense activity, eternal calmness. And when you are just the opposite, he says, in, in, the, in the desert or in the uh, mountain, in the Himalayan mountain caves, your mind should be able to work like a blast furnace. If you have given it a problem and you are... Uh, Concentrating on it, the mind should be busy. It, it can do that. What usually happens to us is, we are calm when things are calm around us. And when things are around us are disturbed or hectic or busy, we also get agitated. That should not happen. So that is the beautiful example of the vast ocean, which is in the midst of storms and huge rivers. Imagine the Brahmaputra, the Ganga, the huge rivers, they pour their waters into the Bay of Bengal. And the Bay of Bengal is just a, a bay. It's, it's not even the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean. Of course, they're all connected. And so, completely unshaken. Imagine that vastness. There are waves on the top. There's waves and foam and spray and so on and so forth. A lot of activity going on. But there's 10,000 feet of, of deep calmness below that. So the mind of the enlightened person is like that. I remember reading about Swami Turiyananda, one of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. In his old age, he was regarded as a Brahma Jnani, enlightened person. In his old age in Banaras, Varanasi, Sivashram, he was suffering, physically suffering. He had many problems, asthma and many other things. When somebody says, Swami, does it, uh, are you suffering a lot? He says, yes, the body, but then he says with a big smile, in Bengali, I'll translate, uh, in English it means, but by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, inside it is all ice. In a good sense, not that he's cold and detached. In Bengali he said, Tabe bhetorta thakur barov kore I'm completely untouched. Remember in India, heat is suffering. So in the cold climates of Europe or in America, so you say, warm welcome. <laughs> I, I guess cold welcome does not really uh, cut it, but in, in India, heat is suffering. So inside it is all ice, means inside it's all good. Swami Shivananda, towards the end of his life, he had a st stroke which left him partially paralyzed. And uh, oh, this was just before that. He was su um, susceptible to asthmatic attacks and he suffered ter terribly. He was the head of the order, of the monastic order, the president. And uh, one night the monks heard from the attendants that the Swami could not sleep at night and he was suffering from that uh, asthmatic attack. Next morning when the monks and devotees came to offer their respects to the Swami, oh, somebody... Yes. <laughs> uh, so the... They asked the Swami, uh, are you suffering a, a lot? Uh, are you all right? He said, yes, of course, I'm fine. And they said, no, but we heard that uh, you couldn't sleep last night. You, these are the problems. And the Swami said, as if it was realization dawning upon him, oh, you mean the body? Oh, no, no, it's not at all fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, he's not play acting. For him, it is nothing. I have myself seen. Swami Bhuteshanandaji, the 12th president of the order, he lived to more than 98 plus. When, when I saw this, it was 98. He was around 98 years. 
and he had many physical problems. And, um, so that day particularly, I think he had a high, he was running a high fever, 102, 105, something like that. And we all went to offer our pranams, our salutations. And one of the, we were too junior to ask, we would just see from a distance. The senior monks would speak with him. Um, so one of the monks said to him, Swami, uh, how, how are you today? In Bengali, it means, Shorir Kamon, how is your body today? Uh, literally, how is the body? And the Swami said, he would speak in a slow drawl, why do you people keep talking about the body? Tumra to shorir, shorir karo kano. They're simple things, he would let us know. Another time somebody asked him, and he was very humorous, except that he would never smile himself. <laughs> he would, everybody would crack up. Imagine uh, um, a room full of maybe 100 or 200 monks all laughing and giggling, and he's just sitting quietly there. Um, this one is completely untranslatable into English, but I'll just tell you a little bit. Once sometimes somebody asked the same question, how's the body today? How, Shorir Kamon, how are you today? Literally, how is the body today? Now he gave a whole com catalog of what's wrong with the body. And there are particular turns of phrases in Bengali for particular kinds of aches and pains. Um, we Bengalis are awful, what, what is it called? Um, always thinking about diseases and <laughs> hypochondriacs, yes. So the language reflects it. It, it has got <laughs> rich, detailed descriptions of every possible ache and pain. <laughs> so he says, um, my uh, eyes are <laughs> in Bengali, you know, and heart gulo kon kon korche. So literally, it means something like my um, forehead is throbbing and the uh, eyes are, are you know, scratchy or irritable and uh, the, there is a shooting pain in my shoulders and there is a, a stabbing pain in my... Uh, <laughs> and there's, a, there's this pain in the knees. And so from the top of the head till the toes, he, he gave a... Till we were, we were laughing so much. And then he's with this, uh, this sweet voice, in a slow voice, he said, but... Don't think I am complaining. I am happy with all of this. <laughs> but he said, Tabe ami complain kochi na, shab ni ami anundi achi. He would be like that. So, all the, it's not only pleasurable sensations, all the painful sensations, they all run into this ocean. They are ocean like. The few I would say are enlightened I have met. It is a wonderful exam example uh, comparison. They are like oceans, vast and unperturbable, uh, deep down. On top they may be joking or scolding, or affectionate, stern, whatever. But deep down, very deep and very compassionate. There's a kind of endless, unconditional compassion about them. Not just a loved one, you feel absolutely one with that person. There is absolutely no judgment. And there is 110% well-wisher. I mean, that doesn't mean they won't scold. They can be very harsh scolding, but always for the, for the, for the welfare. You never forget once you hear one of them. I haven't. <laughs> They're always for the good, of, for your own good. And sometimes I've heard, me, uh, I and other monks, we remember those scoldings from those very senior monks like blessings for the rest of our life. It's unforgettable. So such a person, sashanti mapnoti nakamakami, such a person attains peace, true peace, lasting peace, unshakable peace. Nakamakami, not the desire of desirer of desires. Kamakami, desirer of desires. The one who thinks, if I get that, then I'll be happy. And that could be anything. The entire world is there in that that. That person, that uh, job, that career, that education, that degree, that word of praise, that position in, in the hierarchy, uh, that apartment, that award, or just finish this work, achieve this much in my life, never. Never. None of that will ever fulfill you. 
It's good. You have to keep on doing it. That's your karma and that's what has to be done in the world. But not because you want something back from it. Nakama kami. Now next verse, 71. Another beautiful verse. Vihaya kamanya sarvan Vihaya kamanya sarvan Pumang charati nispriha Pumang charati nispriha Nirmamo nirahankara Nirmamo nirahankara Sashantim adhigachati Sashantim adhigachati this enlightened being attains to peace. Sashanti Madhigachati realizes or attains to the ultimate peace. How? The earlier one also attains to peace. And this one also attains to peace. But here it's saying just the opposite. Very interesting. Here he says, there he says, allow all the desires, all the experiences to flow through your mind. Remain unperturbed like the vast ocean. Here he says, give up all the desires completely. <laughs> Vihaya Kaman Yasarvan. All desires. The commentator says, Lokika, Alokika ancha. Lokika means all desires of this world. Alokika, all heavenly desires, all that will be fulfilled in heaven. All those desires, giving, giving them up completely, renouncing them completely, internally, renouncing them completely. And worldly desires also two things, gross physical things which are there. Uh, the commentator gives examples. Your, your fields and your houses and wealth, Physical things. And he says, Manorajya Rupan Vasana Matranscha of the form of daydreaming, the, the, the illusory things we are thinking about. If it were so, it would be so nice. Yeah. All that. Giving all that up. Pumang Charati Nishpriya. So does this person sit with eyes closed, not interacting with the world? No. Moves about the world freely. Charati moves around the world freely. Does whatever has to be done in life. Whatever our particular, Arjuna has his battlefield. We also, each of us, has, we have our own battlefield. We move around. Do what you have to do. Nispriha. Spriha means thirst. Moves around without thirst. Nispriha, nispriha with quenched thirst. Not moving around thirstily. Moving around thirstily means this will fulfill me. That will fulfill me. Want, want, want. Not like that. Pumang charati nispriha. Nirmamo nirahankara. How is this person? Without ego. Nirahankara. Nirmamo. Without the idea of possession. Without I and mine. I and mine. Ahankara, I. M mama is mine. Aham mama. This is the n nature of samsara. I and mine. These things have to be understood very well. Otherwise they can be <laughs> dynamite. So does it mean I have to... Donate everything to the Red Cross and, uh, and become homeless. Take up residence in Central Park or something like that. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. Again, remember, the context itself will make it clear. They are both of them warriors. Both of them kings. None of them is talking about giving up anything particularly. They are going to do what, what their duty is. Internally. Nirahankara, not I. It means, what is this ego? What is this ego? The ego is a function of the mind, which says I. And immediately when the mind, you can right now you can say I. Oh, I am sitting here. I am listening to this. I am happy. What an, what an interesting lecture. I am bored. What a boring lecture. I, I, I. Whatever is having, happening in the body-mind complex, this I gets connected to them. This I gets attached to it. This is called ahankara, ego. This is what connects us to the body-mind complex. Now, what does it mean to be egoless? See, there is a general term in which egotistic means a person who has a big ego. That's a different thing. And that, of course, one should not have a big ego. One should be humble and all of that. But we have to, this here it goes to the root of the whole thing. Even the very functioning of the ego, which says I, I, I all the time. I am proud, bad. I am humble, I am um, saintly, I am so nice. That's also bad. Because you're still stuck. You're still stuck with that ego. It's stuck with a particular condition of the mind. Whatever be the condition of the mind, 
whatever the 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 ego the ahankara will get attached to that and we think i am that what vedanta does to you is to show you that you are not that i that that ego itself is not you you are the consciousness in which the ego appears functions and disappears to put it in another way so you are not the ego you are the consciousness you are the witness of the ego this is one way to put it you are the witness of your ego how can i be the witness how can i become the witness of my ego just notice it right now when you say i i am sitting here i am trying to understand what he is talking about i doesn't this whole thing appear to you in your awareness are you that i or are you the awareness which knows or illumines and lights up that i whether i am talking about the vertical i not the <laughs> so you are not the ego you are the witness of your ego this is one way to understand it another way to have the same effect is what does the i refer to the ego what does it refer to refer to means when i say any every word has a referent so when i say book it refers to this object when i say when i say cloth it refers to this object when we say i what does it refer to yeah just see i this we can point it out it refers to this here so this i the i refers to body mind swami vivekananda in fact says just close your mind and say to yourself i and if any thought of body or mind this person comes up you're not enlightened yet <laughs> i'll come to you hold on to your question then wh- what is the difference between us and the enlightened person the enlightened person truly knows is fully aware of the body fully aware of the mind just like us and yet is aware of the underlying reality the background consciousness in which the body mind appears functions and disappears and the i which is firmly in the mind i is a function of the mind it refers it points back to that consciousness so when the enlightened person says i he means he or she means two things one is primarily primarily for himself or herself in his heart of heart knows that i am the witness consciousness chidananda roopa shivoham i am of the nature of eternal bliss and awareness and for our sake that uh, the enlightened person can behave just like one of us i am talking walking eating but in a secondary sense so when the enlightened person behaves like the body mind the enlightened person is using the ego in a secondary sense knowing very well that the ego does not refer to this the i does not refer to this for the enlightened person the reference of the i has shifted back to the background existence consciousness place the witness consciousness this shifting of the reference of the ego is another sense in which the, you, to go beyond the ego two ways one is you are the witness of the ego you are not the ego and therefore whatever the ego attaches itself to you you are not that also the ego will automatically get attached to body mind you are not that so th- that is one way of saying of going beyond the ego the ego will continue to function but i am not that one way another way same thing shifting the reference of the ego it's not body and mind ego means the witness consciousness Do you still remember your question? Yes. Uh, is the I between is the I ah uh, what do you mean by the I do you mean the ego the the feeling of I the feeling of I the feeling of I notice it carefully where is it it's in the mind it's the ego it's the aham if you notice I when you feel I when you think i it's in the mind and in fact this sensation of the i this this feeling of the i it's a function of the what in vedanta is called the antakarana the inner instrument in sanskrit is called ahankara so this works only when the mind is working do you see mind is always working no when you fall asleep where is the i in deep sleep where is the ego but you don't have to go to deep sleep in actual in day to day life when you are very focused 
when you're doing something with tremendous focus, playing a game of tennis, a neuroscientist, a neurosurgeon operating on the brain with tremendous focus, there is no extra, there is no extra cognitive bandwidth left over for feeling I am playing or I am operating. If you think that, anybody who plays a musical instrument or a game knows that if you become self-conscious, you, you it breaks the flow, right? So at that time also, the, at that instant, the feeling of I also disappears. Though you are still aware, you are very much aware. In fact, you are very alert. And yet there is no feeling of I. So the ego comes on and off. One um, neuroscientist described it beautifully. Her name is Susan Blackmore, I think. Um, she wrote the Oxford very short introduction to consciousness. She said, imagine a refrigerator. The refrigerator has a light. When you open the door, what happens? The light comes on. You see the light. When you shut it, is the light on or off? <laughs> the moment you try to locate the eye, it's there. <laughs> but a lot of time in our life, we forget the eye. But the eye is not consciousness. These are things which are people are not clear about in consciousness studies yet. The self-consciousness of the ego, it's one function of the mind. Even when it is not there, you're still fully conscious. When you are playing a game or playing a classical music instrument, tremendous concentration. You're not aware of I. I am playing. You'll, you'll miss something there. Will you say, I was not conscious? No, no, no. You were conscious. You were, in fact, much more conscious. You were at the, the peak of your consciousness, your, your flow. You were in flow. So the ego is a function of the inner instrument. Uh, so this I is not constant. But, but... If you are not referring to the feeling of I, the functioning of the ego, but you are referring to what the I refers to. When you say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am the witness consciousness. I am that absolute reality. That I, it's no longer a function of the mind. It refers to the real you. Yeah. So in that sense, the I, the real I, is eternal. It's forever. In fact, eternal is also a time word. Time is also experienced. Its presence and absence is experienced in the real I. Does this make sense? There is, put it this way, there is an I which is the person, the little person. That little person comes and goes. If every day, when you fall asleep, it goes. In deep sleep, it goes. I'll come to you. I just remembered an awful little joke <laughs> which was told to me by a monk who is a, who's very senior, who is 86 years old. So it's, it's, a, it's a senior joke. So, <laughs> but because the person who told me is a senior, it's not offensive. So he, he said uh, in an assisted living facility, so this uh, philosopher goes to preach to the old folks there, they all gather around him and listen to him, who's less than half their age. And he starts, so the real question is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And they all look at him and one little old lady says to him, my dear, if you don't remember, ask the desk, they know everybody here. <laughs> now the point is, even in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, when I don't even remember who I am, I, I might not even remember who I, the person, am. Uh, the very personality might change. Vast chunks of my memory might disappear. Am I not conscious? I'm still conscious. It's not the mind we are talking about. It's something which transcends the mind. In it, the mind plays and appears and disappears. Yes. You had a follow-up? Good. <laughs> this verse, Vihaya kaman yas sarvan pumangsh charati nishpriha nirmamo nirahankara sashanti madhikachati. Look at the contrast between this verse and the earlier verse. Earlier verse says, Let all things come and all experiences come into my awareness. I am unperturbed, like the vast ocean, 10,000 feet of calm water beneath me. 
And here it says, giving up pursuing all those experiences, I attain peace. But both mean the same thing. Even when all those experiences in life are coming to you, your internal attitude is like this. Vihaya kaman yas sarvan. The, the com Sanskrit commentator Madhusudan Saraswati says, as you walk along, he gives the example of a monk. As the monk walks along the, um, the grassy mountain paths, the little grass of the mountain, it, um, you know, the way it touches your feet as you walk, walk past it, the touch of these desires is like that, inconsequential, very small. All kinds of desires of this world, in your mind, and whatever, he they, they were big on heavenly desires in those days. So, they used to perform elaborate rituals so that after death, it's all accumulated in your heavenly credit account. <laughs> Wells Fargo. Or whatever. <laughs> and you get it when you go, go so the belief of the Vedic uh, people was, after death, you go to a whole hierarchy of, of heavens. Depending upon how much credit you have got, you go to a better heaven, a better... None of them are permanent, and none of them are particularly spiritual. The spiritual heaven talked about by the dualistic religions is different. The Vaikuntha of the Vaishnavas, the Kailasha of the Shaivas, or the heaven of the Christians. That's, a, that's an eternal heaven, that's different. But uh, that's in dualistic religion. But these were otherworldly, worldly places. Uh, of uh, of pleasure and uh, you know, so even those pleasures they are they are of no consequence to the one who has realized I am the absolute. I remember once when we are novices, um, senior monk was teaching us something like this and talking about. They all the original texts will always talk about giving up worldly and otherworldly pleasures, laukika alaukika, worldly and otherworldly. And somebody said. I don't want the oh, pleasures of heaven and those otherworldly pleasures. And the Swami looked at this young novice and said, that's because you don't believe in it. <laughs> it's all imaginary to you. So these days we are so secular and modern and so settled, uh, settled in our, this world is real. If you would even get a taste, he said, an uh, inkling of what is possible in other worlds and other bodies, you cannot give up the, the little cookie here and you think you'll give, give up. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just because we don't believe in it. It's like, like the person who says, um, you know, I dreamt I won the lottery, the, the Powerball, $300 million. And I'm not attached. I give it all to you. Dreamt. The money... <laughs> You, know, you can be the greatest philanthropist ever with the, with the dream money. <laughs> it's not so easy when you consider it to be absolutely real. But for this person, precisely for that reason, for this enlightened person, it's like dream money. It's not real in itself. What is real? Brahman is real. Brahman in that form. You know the story of the princess of Kashi? Yeah. I won't repeat it here. I have repeated it too many times. Yeah. So, when you realize, I alone am appearing in these ways, what is there to be attained there? It is ever attained. It is an appearance. Why would you desire something which comes up on the film screen? Even the choices to food, you would like to see that, very nice, but you are not particularly unhappy because it disappeared. Because it wasn't there to begin with. Sashanti yeah. Madhigachati. The two are exactly the same. The, first, the 70th verse and the 71st. Swami Suhitanandaji, with whom I when, I, when I was a new novice, I was trained by him. And he was trained by Swami Premeshanandaji, who was the disciple of Masharada. And Swami Suhitanandaji, I still remember, the first time I read this verse, I still remember, we were walking with him, and with great you know, enthusiasm and force, he chanted this verse. And he said this was one of Swami Premeshanandaji's favorites. He would chant it with great vigor. He even showed how Swami Premeshananda would chant it. Vihaya kaman yas sarvan pumams charati nispriha nirmamo nirahankara sashanti madhigachati. Swami Premeshananda would chant that. So without knowing too much of the meaning, it immediately I, I sort of made up my mind. It's going to be one of my favorites too. <laughs> yes. Last verse. 
again a very profound, very beautiful verse. Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati Stitvasya Mantaka Lepi Stitvasya Mantaka Lepi Brahma Nirvanam Richati Brahma Nirvanam Richati O Arjuna, this is the Brahmic state, the state of Brahman. Brahmi Stiti Partha. This is the state of the enlightened, the one who has realized, I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. You will say, good for that person, what about me? You are Brahman too. The joke is, we are all, this, this Brahmi Stiti, this state of being Brahman, is right here, right now for each one of us. We just don't see it. That's all. That makes all the difference. And say like your, uh, the proverbial rich uncle has left you a million or maybe a billion dollars and you're still on welfare. Why? Because I don't know. I am a billionaire in theory, but I don't know where it is. Where is the passbook? Where is the bank? How do I collect the money? No. Are you a billionaire? Yes. Practically, no. We are like that. We are none other than the Absolute. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And yet, yet here we are, <laughs> suffering in this world. Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha. You should see some such person. We begin to get an inkling of what it can be. To. I'll share something a little private here. I don't think I've told anybody in public earlier. When I was a novice in our main monastery under, um, this was in 96, 97, 1996. So we used to go every day to offer pranams, salutations to the head of the monastery, which was at that time Swami Bhuteshananda, 12th president of the order. And I was very young. I mean, I, mean, I was a newcomer, so I would be like at the bottom of the chain. So I'd be at the ba back uh, all the time, and the senior monks would be at the front. And I still remember that day, a most peculiar reaction I had to the Swami. He was sitting there, as usual. Remember, this is 97 years old, 98 years old. At that time, he was 97. I remember standing there and feeling, of all things, jealous. A kind of holy jealousy filled me that I want what you have. That was the, I still remember the place, the exact place I was standing in the door and the window from through which I was looking at him. You have something which I want. It's the most precious thing in this world. It's the point of, of being alive. It's the point of human life. Swami Vivekananda said, the goal of life, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within. So that manifested divinity, you see, somebody who has had a taste of it. So, it applies. Esha Brahmi Stiti. Krishna is as if pointing out, look, O oh Arjuna, this is the state of enlightenment. The Brahmic state. It's, the state is within quotes. It's not a state. It's the reality. Being alive in a body is a state, being dead is a state, being awake is a state, being dreaming, deep sleep, these are states, coma, these are states, meditation is a state, going to heaven is a state, whatever comes and goes is a state. All of it limited by time and space, but this one is not limited, it is the reality underlying all states. Hey, great, how do I get there? How do I get there? It's not a journey in space. It's not a journey in time. It's not a journey from one to the other. It's not that it's in heaven or some holy place. I have to go there somehow in pilgrimage. No. It's right here. It's you. It's not that, yeah, it's me. But, you know, it's only after enlightenment, after death, after something happens, after time. No. Not a post-mortem spirituality. Here and now. Not a journey in time. Not a journey in space. Not a journey from one to the other. You see, every journey is to something which we don't have yet. A place, a thing, a person, an experience. It's not even that. 
when we do become enlightened, we'll realize, oh, it was always there and I always was it. Helplessly so, choicelessly so. You will realize it was always perfectly all right. That is Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha. Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati. Yeah, I have one little question. I suppose I, I do realize that, but then now I don't have it, I don't realize it. Can this happen again? Can I again get trapped in samsara? He says, no. Once you attain it, once you touch it, once it, you realize that, you can never be trapped in samsara, never be trapped by ignorance again. So what is the journey then, a spiritual journey? Not in space, not in time, not from one thing to another. It's a journey from ignorance to knowledge. It's a journey from not realizing to suddenly realizing. It's a journey from not recognizing to recognizing. I'm playing a little fast and loose with the specific philosophical terminology. But in general it's fine. Recognizing, not recognizing is Kashmiri Shaivism. Realization is Advaita Vedanta, enlightenment. But whatever you call it, it's basically a journey from ignorance to knowledge. So won't the ignorance come and catch me again? He says, no. Nainam prapya, nainam prapya vimuhyati. You can never be deluded once ignorance is destroyed. Knowledge destroys ignorance just like light destroys darkness. Well, you are telling me straight away, here's a nice little uh, wrinkle to this. Let me just put it to you. If the question ever came to you, this will make sense. If it doesn't come to you, don't bother. <laughs> because the question is, yeah, you're sort of shouting that, no, it will never come again. But always a little doubt remains in the, in the back of my mind. It could come again, you know. And just by shouting doesn't solve it. It's logically impossible for it to come again. Why? Madhusudan Saraswati in his commentary, Gurartha Deepika, a lamp to the profound hidden meaning of the Gita. There he makes a point. He says, Anaditvena anutpadyamana. Always, whenever Maya is described, ignorance is talked about in Vedanta. One of the things he said about it is, Anadi, beginningless. Why is it said beginningless? Because the question always is, so when did this begin? It's all due to ignorance. So when did I become ignorant about my real nature, Brahman? And so that question is meaningless. Because this ignorance is beginningless. So aren't you escaping the question? Beginning and beginningless means how? How can it something be beginningless? But it's true. All ignorance is beginningless. I give this example. Um, it's not mine. It is insight. Simple insight was given to me by Professor J. N. Mohanty. Um, he said in a talk in the Institute of Culture in Calcutta in Gold Park. He said, ignorance is always beginningless. Just think about it. In the, in the uh, audience in Calcutta, he said, how many of you um, know German? So if I ask you, sir, do you know German? The person said, no. Now if I ask you, since when do you not know? When did your ignorance about German begin? He said, from my very birth. And he said, oh, so before your birth, you knew German. It's true, it's a fact. We never think about it that way. Any kind of igno ignorance is beginningless. I don't know how to pi play the piano. Since when do you not know how to play the piano? The question is meaningless. Forever. Ever and ever I don't know how to play the piano. But if I start learning German, if I start learning to play the piano, ignorance will be dispelled. That is true. So ignorance is beginningless in that sense. But it can be removed by knowledge. So this is the, this is the usual discourse. We know this. But there is another little thing, like a little time bomb hidden there. Notice what is said. Ignorance is beginningless. That which does not have a beginning, wait for it, that which does not have a beginning cannot be produced. Cannot come, cannot arise. If you say, yeah, I become enlightened, but can't ignorance come again? Can't it arise again? Madhusudan Saraswati says, no. Because it is beginningless. That which does not have a beginning, you yourself admitted it does not have a beginning. It cannot begin. <laughs> see how the simple elegance of it? Yeah, yeah, I think many of you see it. You need not be afraid. Just become enlightened. That's it. After that, no problems. 
It's guaranteed. Ignorance is not going to come back because it, it has its beginningless. If you admit that, it cannot begin. There's no way it can be produced. <laughs> Just a little word, he says. Anaditvena anutpadyamana. It cannot be produced. It cannot begin. It cannot come. Sthitva uh, syam. Hold on to the question. Sthitva syam antakaliyavi. The ending is so beautiful. Even at the very end of our lives, at the last conscious moment of our lives, if you come up across this, it's done. Sthitva api asyam antakaliyavi. At the time of death also, at that point. Till that point also I have not realized. But at that point if I do realize. Brahma nirvana mrichyati. One attains nirvana in Brahman. Or one attains, the two, two interpretations. One attains Brahman which is nirvana. Nirvana means the final release, ultimate spiritual freedom. And the commentator says, At the point of death also, by the grace of Guru, by the grace of God, if attains, one attains enlightenment. What to speak of, he says, from one's youth, the one who is, who is established in this knowledge and living like that, Jivan Mukta, enlightened while living. Of course that person attains the final release at the point of death. For that person it's no difference at all. At the point of death, it's, it's a great encouragement. Sometimes we see a lot of spiritual practice surrender, especially to God, the God of religion, Saguna Brahman. And by the grace of Guru, by the grace of God, even if we have not yet attend, attained, at that point when a vast change takes place, this body identification which we find it so difficult to let go of, it's going by itself. And this knowledge is clear in our minds. Enlightenment takes place at that point. There are other points. <laughs> Every day when you, if you have the experience of waking up from a dream which is still vivid, Try to compare it and see that vivid dream, this vivid waking up is becoming more and more vivid and that's beginning to fade away. Both of them are appearing to what consciousness? That's also a crucial window of opportunity. And there are many such windows of opportunity. Dev devotees, many devotees by the grace of God. I've told you, so many devotees' lives, if you see at the end of their lives, they have a vision of the chosen deity. God in the form they worshipped all throughout their lives. For the first time they begin to see. And um, that leads them. There are so many such examples. That is not within the syllabus of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, but, that's, but one must be practical. The story of Kalipada Ghosh. You know, who was a great drunkard and then got slowly reformed by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna. And forced Sri Ramakrishna to give him initiation. I've told you the story how uh, on a boat... On the river Ganga, Sri Ramakrishna is there in the boat and Kalipada Ghosh, who's a rich man, he said, I'll take you across to, to, the, to the city of Calcutta. Come with me in my boat. But he had a plan. So Sri Ramakrishna gets in, innocently gets into the boat and then Kalipada Ghosh stops the boat in the middle of the river, catches hold, falls at his feet and catches hold of his feet and says, have grace upon me. Kripa Kurum. Sri Ramakrishna is confused. What is this? What is this drama in the... Uh, Come on, start the boat. No, I will, we will not go any further until you, you are gracious to me. And then finally, Sri Ramakrishna has to give him initiation, mantra diksha. Here is the mantra. Take it. An avatar, an incarnation is initiating you. And Kalipada Ghosh still says, no. No, that's not what I want. He didn't say, that's not what I want. He said, he keeps saying, no, this is not enough. Have grace upon me. Then Sri Ramakrishna says, you don't have to repeat the mantra also. It will be done by itself. Now let's go. Uh, and he says, no, no. Then finally Sri Ramakrishna has to say, but what do you want then? What do you want from me? And then he says, with a voice choked with tears, he says, he called him Baba, Father. Father, when, when I die, it will be dark and none of my relatives will be near me. As the darkness surrounds me, promise me that you will come at that time. And you will have... A lantern, he says, you, he describes it so vividly, a lantern in your left hand. And with your right hand, you will catch hold of me, you'll take hold of me and take me through that darkness. You will come for me at the time of my death. Promise me that. And Sri Ramakrishna says, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> let's go now. 
And that actually happened decades later, long after Sri Ramakrishna had passed away. And when Kalipada Ghosh was about to pass away, and at that time one of the Swamis was visiting, because the Swami was visiting a lot of the relatives who were gathered around his, the dying man's bed, they left, they thought he's there. And at that time he passed away. It's, it came true that the relatives were not there. And at that point, Kalipada Ghosh suddenly says, oh, Father, you have come for me, you did not forget me. And... Uh, he passed away. So there's not just one. There are many, many, many such examples. This is what he means. Sthitva asyam antakaleyabhi. If at the point of death also, even by the grace of God, if God points it out to you, this is your real, real nature. Brahma nirvana mrichyati. You are freed into, into Brahman, into your absolute nature. Question. Yes. But we spend some lectures on Spitta Pragya. Yes. So is it the same as that stabilized knowledge? Yes, stabilized knowledge. That is true. That so is true. So that what you get some intuition, that's, that's not enough. So Remember, even if you get the intuition, the true intuition will never ban- vanish. If something gets clouded over and you get confused, then it's not that one. The, we, we get a series of insights in spiritual life. We do. We are all spiritual seekers and we will keep, we will keep, keep getting it. But there is a breakthrough I'm speaking about. Once that happens, it never goes away. Even if a person does not do any practice after that, does not pay any attention to that, at a moment's notice it's available to you. Just like your own identity is available to you. That requires that stabilization. That's what the Sthita Pragya. But he says, suppose you have not been able to attain that. But there's another possibility. One possibility is you'll come back life after life and then go further ahead. Another possibility is at the point of death also one may get released. But that requires a special grace of God or the Guru. And of course, that does not mean I won't do anything till then. We are spiritual seekers. Of course you will pursue uh, spiritual enlightenment till the very... What else will you do? What else is worth doing? Swami Abhedananda, who was here, um, a young lady came up to him about a hundred years ago when he was in America, great excitement, and said, um, Swami, is this true, what you're talking about, all of this? She said, yes. And he said, if this is true, what else matters? And then she said, and if this is not true, what else matters? And she went away, never to come back again. And he heard that he, she had retreated into a, an island retreat and spent the rest of her days in meditation and contemplation. Salinger here, right here in New York, J.D. Salinger, who used to go to the East Side Center, he became so convinced of it, he completely retreated from worldly activities. He kept on writing, but he said, I'll never publish again. Uh-huh. I don't want anything back from it. I am, God has given me this talent, so this is my way I worship. Uh, so I'm just giving an example. If this is true, what else matters? If this is not true, what else matters? Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu